journalism. Our moderator will be Judge Gregory Katzis of the, the, the D.C. Circuit. He is a graduate of Princeton and the Harvard Law School. After law school, he clerked on the Third Circuit for Judge Edward Becker. He also clerked for Justice Thomas, both at the Supreme Court and uh, during his time at the D.C. Circuit. Greg spent his time in private practice at Jones Day, but he has held uh, quite a few posts in government from 2001 to 2009, held a variety of posts in the DOJ, uh, including acting associate attorney general. Uh, he was most recently, before his uh, confirmation, serving as deputy assistant and deputy counsel to the president. Uh, and Greg, uh, during his time as a litigator, I'm sorry, Judge Katz is during his time as a litigator, uh, has argued three Supreme Court cases and, in fact, has argued in every single court of appeals in the country. Uh, so now moving on to the panelists, uh, we have Eric Murphy, who's the state solicitor of Ohio. Uh, he has been since 2013. Eric is a graduate of uh, Miami University and the University of Chicago Law School. He clerked for Judge Wilkinson on the Fourth Circuit and for Justice Anthony Kennedy. He, too, practiced uh, at Jones Day before taking his current position in which he's argued multiple Supreme Court cases, including this year a win in the Waters of the United States case. Uh, next to him, we have Professor Peter Shane from, I'm sorry, the Jacob E. Davis and Jacob E. Davis II Chair of, uh, in Law at Ohio State University, the Moritz College of Law. He's a graduate of Harvard and Yale, uh, clerked for Judge Alvin Rubin of the Fifth Circuit before working for a while in the Office of Legal Counsel and the Office of Management and Budget. He's held a number of uh, academic positions in addition, to the, to, in addition to the one he currently has at Ohio State, where he was honored in 2011 as a uh, university distinguished professor. And finally, we have Professor Jonathan Adler, who is the Johann Verage Memorial Professor at Case Western University School of Law, along with the director of the Center of Business Law and Regulation. He's a graduate of uh, Yale and George Mason, and you are almost certainly familiar with his work uh, at the Vola Conspiracy, where he's a frequent contributor. So with that, please welcome the panel. So I'll, I'll kick things off briefly. Um, we have an hour to address originalism and federalism. Um, it's a pretty ambitious uh, agenda. Um, but it's ambitious mainly because of fairly recent developments that have occurred over the course of my professional lifetime. Um, if we were doing this panel when I was in law school, um, it could be a pretty short discussion because, frankly, at that time, nobody took originalism or federalism very seriously. Um, if you think back a couple of decades um, ago, Supreme Court ra rarely, if ever, looked to constitutional text or history in addressing the questions that come before them. And perhaps their general approach was best encapsulated in their Eighth Amendment jurisprudence, where they said that the meaning of the Cruel and Unusual Punishments Clause was determined by evolving standards of decency and where it had applied those standards to strike down or severely limit capital punishment, even though that practice was universally followed at the time of the framing and explicitly recognized in constitutional text. Originalism's obviously made a comeback. Um, we have the Heller decision governing Second Amendment claims and applying originalist standards. We have Crawford in the Confrontation Clause area. Um, but we also have many, many areas of constitutional interpretation that have um, remained unchanged. Um, and we have the court in, at least in the substantive due process area, perhaps breaking new ground the other way with the rather spectacularly unoriginalist decision a couple of years ago, striking down traditional marriage in Obergefell. Um, so I think one of the issues we'll probably talk about is um, how much of a difference are, are these decisions like Heller isolated blips or are they um, illustrations of more fundamental changes yet to come. Same basic approach on federalism. A generation ago, people would have said that um, Congress has virtually unlimited power under the Commerce Clause, and if there are little slivers of things they couldn't do under the Commerce Clause, they could do those things under the Necessary and Proper Clause. 
the 10th Amendment was thought to be a truism, and the 14th Amendment, Section 5, and the Spending Clause were thought to be broad, if not unlimited. General approach to federalism was summarized in the Garcia decision, where the court said states can protect their interests because they can go beg for favors um, from Congress in Congress. Um, different picture now, right? We've had three decisions um, where the court has imposed Commerce Clause limits on Congress. We have the NFIB decision, which has reinvigorated limits not only on the commerce power, but the necessary and proper and the spending power. We have the commandeering cases, which have made the, resurrected the 10th Amendment a little bit. And we have the City of Bernie line of cases um, imposing limits on Section 5. Raising the same kinds of question, are these small tweaks on the outer bounds, or are these the first signs of a more fundamental return to um, originalist principles of federalism? So with that, um, let me turn the floor over to uh, General Murphy. Thank you. Yeah, happy to be here this, uh, uh, at the second conference. It's, uh, it's a great privilege to speak today. Um, uh, I'm, I'm going to spend my time uh, foc focusing on or originalism from the practitioner's perspective uh, as the practitioner on the, on the panel. Uh, and uh, with respect to that question, uh, I can say un un unabashedly that um, originalism should have uh, a big impact on the way uh, lawyers practice today. Uh, lawyers need to be uh, uh, conversant in the originalist mode of interpretation. They need to incorporate originalist arguments in their legal briefs to courts. Those are the arguments, as Greg mentioned, uh, arguments about text and history uh, uh, with respect to the question before the court. I think if advocates do not do that, they put themselves at a uh, serious disadvantage. Uh, and I'll just go through a few reasons why I think that is the case. Uh, the first and most obvious reason is, as Greg said, uh, we now have many originalist judges in federal and state courts. And if you have originalist judges in federal and state courts, it makes sense to make originalist arguments to those judges. Uh, uh, I think gone are the days uh, uh, of, of what Justice Scalia used to say in, in one of his stump speeches. Uh, I, I, I quoted him from a, a 2005 speech. He said, uh, originalism was still such a minority position uh, in modern academia and in modern legal circles, that on occasion I'm asked when I've given a talk like this, a question from the back of the room, Justice Scalia, when did you first become an originalist? As though it is some kind of weird affliction that seizes some people, like, when did you first start eating human flesh? Uh, I, I, I don't think it's accurate uh, to say that anymore. Uh, I think originalism is now uh, in, in, in the mainstream of um, conservative circles. Uh, and, and you can look, look no further than uh, Justice Gorsuch's speech at, at the Federal Society Convention this past November, where he unabashedly said, tonight I can report uh, a, a person can be both a committed originalist and textualist and be confirmed to the Supreme Court of the United States. Uh, and the fact that originalist judges are being confirmed to federal courts, being elected in state courts, means you should be making originalist type arguments in your briefs. Uh, there are many originalist judges on, on the federal and state courts. I think that number will only grow in future years. Uh, you need to look no further than um, a recent concurrence by Judge John Bush uh, in our own Sixth Circuit in a uh, uh, Sixth Amendment case involving uh, when the right to counsel attaches in criminal proceedings. When is the right of counsel, when does it get triggered? Uh, I won't get into the legal issue, but I would note that his concurrence begins uh, faithful adherence to the Constitution and its amendments requires us to examine their terms as they were commonly understood when the text was adopted and ratified, rather than applying meaning derived years later that may weaken constitutional rights. Uh, so th these are judges that could be on panels in which you're litigating. Uh, it makes sense to make originalist arguments uh, to these judges. Uh, the second reason why I think originalist arguments need to be presented in legal briefs is uh, even non-originalist judges find those arguments important. Uh, I would say that the main difference between originalist judges and non-originalist judges is that originalist judges think texts and history should be dispositive or conclusive. Uh, Non-originalist judges uh, uh, will just find it important, but they'll uh, look to other indicia of constitutional uh, uh, interpretation. Um, the, best, the best example I like to give for that point uh, is a debate between uh, Justice Scalia and Justice Brennan 
uh, in a case called Burnham versus Superior Court of California. It was a 1990 decision. Uh, the, the decision actually involved uh, so-called tag jurisdiction. Uh, it's a personal jurisdiction case uh, by which uh, tag jurisdiction historically meant if I just traveled to Kentucky, if I was on the border, traveled to Kentucky uh, to get gas or something and I was personally served with process in Kentucky, I could be served with process over any potential suit, even stuff having nothing to do with my um, uh, trip to, to Kentucky. Uh, so the, the question in Burnham was whether that was consistent with due process, this exercise of general personal jurisdiction over people who might just be traveling through the state. The court unanimously held that it was consistent with due process principles, but the court, uh, in very uh, distinct opinions, uh, issued different rationales. Uh, Justice Scalia's rationale was an originalist rationale. Uh, the due process clause should have the meaning uh, that history would give it. So if there is a well-established uh, uh, well, uh, practice, long practiced in the states, then that's uh, dispositive on the due process question. Uh, there probably was, according to Justice Scalia at least, no more established principle than trans um, transient or tag jurisdiction. So that ended the question. Uh, Justice Brennan um, uh, had uh, a concurring opinion uh, in which he uh, clearly indicated that uh, uh, history itself was a factor. So tradition was a factor. He said, although I agree that history is an important factor in establishing whether a jurisdictional rule satisfies due process requirements, I cannot agree that it is the only factor. Uh, he Later on, he said, a tradition, though alone not dispositive, it is, of course, irrelevant to the question. So even non-originalists think originalists uh, arguments are uh, in, important. Uh, and I, I think sometimes non-originalists think originalist arguments are also dispositive. Uh, uh, Judge Katz has men mentioned the Crawford uh, v. Washington uh, decision. That was uh, an originalist revolution uh, in the Confrontation Clause area. Uh, and, and it was a revolution. Um, it, was, it was solely uh, a, a mode of interpretation that was originalist. There was no living constitutional notions of how the Confrontation Clause should evolve. Uh, and it was joined, uh, it was written by Justice Scalia, but it was joined by several um, uh, justices who are not originalists, such as Justice Stevens and Justice Ginsburg. So, uh, at times, uh, originalism, even non-originalists, can find original meaning dispositive. Uh, the, third, the third point I'd like to make uh, uh, on originalism uh, is that I don't, uh, as, an, as an advocate, I think it's never been easier to make originalist arguments. Uh, and the reason I say that is because with the advent of the internet and of large databases, Lexis, Westlaw, Hein Online, uh, it's, it's much, uh, much easier today than it, I think it ever has been to examine um, uh, original interpretation type questions with respect to whatever question is presented. I'll give, I'll give an example in the, uh, the Confrontation Clause area. Uh, the, the state of Ohio had a case, Ohio v. Clark, that went uh, up to the U.S. Supreme Court involving whether a child's three-year-old statements to his teachers about child abuse uh, uh, was testimonial within the meaning of the Confrontation Clause. Uh, the court unanimously, uh, although in split decisions, held that it was not. Uh, and a large portion of our legal brief at the U.S. Supreme Court uh, was tied to the historical treatment of child statements to uh, parents and others about abuse. Uh, historically, it, it was well established, even when there was this confrontation right d developing at common law. Uh, historically, it was established that these types of ch child statements were admissible. Uh, the court relied on that, um, uh, on that literature when, when, when ruling in the state's favor. Um, so I, I think that's, that's all I have. I'll, I'll turn it over to Professor Shill to give us more. Thank you. Uh, it's also a great pleasure and privilege to be here and to be here with uh, this particular panel, uh, very distinguished colleagues. And I, I want to say, I wish I could get um, Solicitor Murphy's remarks put on a tape that I could just play for students, because an important point um, that I think you made is that when you're arguing to judges, um, what counts is their theory of constitutional interpretation, not yours. Uh, and particularly, if you're going to argue to a multi-member court with originalist and non-originalist judges, you want to be adept at multiple methods of interpretation. Um, and I also think, you know, as your remarks indicate, uh, it's possible to overdraw the distinction between originalist and non-originalist thinking. Um, it's a little, you know, originalism is often deployed as a, a word as if it's obvious what that means. 
Um, and yet there's a well-known debate in academic circles, whether we're talking about original intent or what uh, Justice Scalia uh, kind of popularized as the notion of original public meaning. Uh, I would say the high theorist of original public meaning in the academy is Professor Larry Solom at um, Georgetown uh, University. And um, he keeps refining the theory. And, and if you read his work, you would, come you would definitely come to the conclusion that originalism is, is not the faint of heart. Uh, his most recent iteration endorses, and I'm just going to give you a very brief quote just to make the point. He endorses the notion of implicature, the notion that the illocutionary force of a particular communicative act can be implied rather than directly said. Got that? I mean, right? So a simpler way of saying that is that uh, the Constitution may actually mean things or have meant things originally that it did not explicitly say, which of course makes the originalist inquiry yet more difficult. And I suppose with all this complexity, the one advantage of all this complexity I find is often when I make originalist arguments to my more conservative friends, pointing out that originalism points in a more progressive direction, they can tell me with some possibility you know, possible truth to it, that I'm just not doing originalism right. Uh, because, because if you follow Professor Solom and try to do originalism right, that, that's a, a heavy lift. But I do want to make um, just four quick points. One, just to reiterate uh, what Eric Murphy said about the importance of advocates being good at originalist arguments. Um, and, you know, someone once said that the most important skill in winning in the Supreme Court was being able to count to five, uh, and you're not going to get to five in most cases unless you can make uh, effective originalist argument. Um, proof of that uh, institutionally is that one of the kind of foremost uh, appellate advocacy organizations in DC now uh, that is oppositional to a lot of uh, what the current administration is doing is the uh, Constitutional Accountability Center, which was basically created not just now, but back in 2008, dedicated to the proposition that originalist argument could serve progressive causes. So, you know, the, the idea that uh, originalism would always point in the same, or have the same political valence, uh, they just didn't agree with. The second point that I want to make, though, is originalism often is done badly. Uh, and originalist arguments are sometimes accepted by judges as being accurate because, like all human beings, um, they're affected by a certain confirmation bias. Uh, and my favorite confirmation bias joke is that now that confirmation bias has been explained to me, I see it everywhere. Um, thank you. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, and you just have to be careful about arguments that seem historically grounded because they, they turn out the way you'd hoped. Um, Justice Scalia's Heller opinion is often pointed out as, you know, uh, perfect example of originalism. I think it's a very weak opinion. His, historically, it's a horrible opinion in terms of literary theory. But the idea that gun ownership was central to an American concept of citizenship, that was probably a real thing by the mid-19th century. And so in an odd way, Justice Alito's opinion on the incorporation of the Second Amendment is a much better grounded opinion on a, originalist grounds, being originalist with regard to the 14th Amendment, I think, than, than, the, than the Heller opinion. Um, by, by the time the 14th Amendment rolled around, uh, Justice, what Justice Alito said uh, d does have some real historical purchase to it. The third thing I want to say, though, since I don't usually label myself an originalist, is that I think the normative case for originalism is debatable and often puzzling. So I'm currently on uh, an, an amicus brief in a case called Lucia involving whether or not the administrative law judges uh, who handle cases for the Securities and Exchange Commission are officers of the United States and thus uh, should have been appointed by the president uh, or by the heads of the department who would be the members of the SEC themselves or whether they instead are employees who could be appointed as they were uh, in this case by the chief administrative law judge of the SEC. And uh, I mean, on a global scale, uh, constitutionalism 
does not in most countries imply originalism. But um, you know, we start with the text because we have one. I understand that. But it seems a little odd to me that we're wondering whether this scheme for uh, giving people who appear as respondents before the SEC the benefit of genuinely independent judgment uh, should be judged according to whether uh, weighers and gaugers were uh, officers or employees in 1789. The entire federal government in 1789 was about three times the size of the administrative law judge corps of the Social Security Administration alone. So thinking about that we're bound by the text of 1789 and understanding appropriate structures of accountability uh, and independent uh, within the rule of law, it just seems to me not an obvious proposition. The Constitution was intended to enable we the people to govern ourselves. And um, notwithstanding that, they made it very, very hard to amend the Constitution formally when the Constitution uh, basically uh, impedes contemporary popular sovereignty, I think it's a decent question how much in any particular case originalism should be the decisive factor as opposed to other things that are also uh, you know, at stake. And finally, and just you know, because life would be boring if one is not at least a little provocative, um, and you know, I take it I'm here as part of the Federalist Society's loyal opposition. Um, I find the professed allegiance to originalism um, to be a, a little hard to take when it's recommended only to judges. I'm just going to guess that in 1789, when the appointments process was created from the Constitution with regard to, say, justices of the Supreme Court, nobody thought it would be appropriate for the Senate to treat the last year of a presidential term as irrelevant for, in terms of whether or not you would give a hearing with regard to a presidential nominee. Um, and so, you know, if we're going to behave according to uh, what the, the founders thought that they bequeathed by us, uh, to us, uh, amended occasionally, uh, and we should be attentive to uh, the meaning of those words, um, then I think originalism ought to be good across the board. And to quote uh, Larry Solemn, uh, the Constitution may mean things that uh, it does not explicitly say. And one of them is an explicit obligation of good faith in the exercise of political discretion, even when you're not arguing to a judge. Thank you. Professor Adler. Um, it's great to be here. I, I certainly appreciate the opportunity uh, to be on this panel. Uh, it's great to be here with, with General Murphy, with Professor Shane, and with uh, Judge Katsis. And I will admit, I like being able to say that last part. So I'll say it. it's, it's great to be here with, with Judge Katsis. Um, uh, and I'm thrilled to hear that uh, Peter, to hear Peter in, in his remarks, especially at the end, uh, condemn the Senate's treatment of Lillian Bevere uh, in 1991 and 1992. Um, that was shameful. Um, and um, just what I was thinking about. For those, for the, and, and we could we could talk about uh, uh, Judith Hope in, in 1988 and John Roberts in 1990. It's good because it's important to understand uh, this history. Um, I want to make three uh, uh, brief points, uh, and I will try to be brief. Uh, my points may be slightly uh, conclusory, uh, given the time allowed. Um, as fast as I sometimes speak, it would be hard to fully explicate my points in, in a few minutes and leave ample time for, for questions and comments. Uh, but my propositions, or, or the things I want to suggest, are first that, that uh, originalism, and in particular, the idea that the original public meaning of the words of the Constitution uh, is the proper way of interpreting our Constitution. Certainly accept the point that's been suggested that that may not be the proper way to interpret other Constitutions, but it is the proper and long understood way of interpreting our Constitution. That the original public meaning and uh, of the words and the structure of our Constitution uh, establish a Federalist structure uh, and one that was meant to endure in that way. Uh, third point, though, is that um, we've departed quite su substantially uh, from those premises in the actual operation of our system in the, and the courts in particular, although not exclusively, 
uh, have, have uh, Congress and the executive have certainly done their share uh, to migrate away from an original understanding of uh, our constitutional text and structure. And, so, and then I want to close with saying a little bit about kind of where we are and, and, and what we, we do about it. Uh, our, our panel's titled Originalism and Federalism, Where are the Court's Heading? So I'm at least going to say a little bit about originalism, a little bit about federalism, and say at least a little bit about where we are in the courts on these questions, leaving open what, what some of the possible paths might be. When we look at our Constitution uh, and, and read it it's, and, and understand its history, I think it is fairly clear that uh, one reason uh, the Constitution has the structure it has, and indeed one reason that it, it was decided that our Constitution needed to be written was to impose limits uh, in addition to direct and channel the exercise of government power. Um, uh, that the writtenness of the Constitution uh, was a feature. Uh, it was not universally understood that a constitution needed to be a written document. That was a choice. And it was a choice with consequence, among other things, a choice to fix limits so that they would be unchanging until changed. That uh, we would uh, abide by those limits until we, the people, use the, the appropriate process uh, to make those changes. That was the nature of the consent that we, the people, gave uh, to the Constitution, uh, the nature of, of the ratification of that document by the people uh, in the individual states. And this was broadly understood at the time. Uh, uh, as Jonathan O'Neill, author of, of Originalism in American Law and Politics, points out, it was understood that the task of a judge, for instance, was to ascertain and apply uh, the fixed meaning of the written constitution. If you go back and read the opinion, you know, read the, the, the contemporary materials of the time, go back and read, you know, I don't know, Marbury versus Madison, uh, one sees this idea uh, referenced again and again. So just to quote Chief Justice Marshall in Marbury, he reminded us the powers of the legislature are defined and limited, and that those limits may not be mistaken or forgotten. The constitution is written. And he point out to what purpose is, or, or purpose are powers limited, and to what purpose is that limitation committed to writing if these limits may at any time be passed by those intended to be restrained. And these were not controversial statements at the time. There were certainly controversial aspects of, of Chief Justice Marshall's tenure, uh, but this observation uh, was not among them, and if we look at uh, his initial opinions that deal with the Federalist structure, we see this idea repeated. Uh, in Gibbons versus Ogden, the, the, the focus on the text, the idea that the enumeration presupposes something not enumerated, and that something, if we regard the language or the subject of the sentence, must be exclusively eternal commerce of a state. Why do we say commerce among the several states, commerce with Indian tribes, commerce with with foreign nations because there is commerce that is not among the several states, that is not with foreign countries, uh, that is not with the Indian tribes. And indeed, there are things that are not commerce and that those are things that are left uh, to the state. And Chief Justice Marshall reminded us that if we forget that, if we ignore that, if we depart from the original meaning of the text, uh, we are departing from the structure that the Constitution set forth and that we the people consented to. People often point to McCulloch versus Maryland as, as somehow a counterpoint to this, but my own view, that's because people tend not to read the opinion in its entirety. We tend to forget that uh, Marshall reiterates that uh, while it is true that the Necessary and Proper Clause was designed to give Congress broad ability to, uh, to operationalize the powers that had been enumerated, uh, it was still necessary that uh, Congress enact measures that consist with the letter and spirit of the Constitution. I, those things that destroy the idea that we have uh, a federal government of limited and enumerated powers are not consistent with the letter and spirit of the Constitution and then must be struck down. He further pointed out in a passage that seems to often be overlooked, that should Congress, under the pretext of executing its powers, pass laws for the accomplishment of objects not entrusted to the government, it would become the painful duty of this tribunal, should a case requiring such a decision come before it, to say that such an act was not the law of the land. 
that Congress is not merely given means, but there are limited ends that Congress may pursue uh, in the exercise and use of these enumerated powers. Now, it's certainly fair to note that the judicial doctrine we have today on the meaning of the Constitution and on federalism in particular is, uh, has, has traveled a great distance from what uh, the Constitution itself laid out and what Chief Justice Marshall suggested. Uh, as as uh, the late Justice Scalia put it uh, in a lecture, a famous lecture he delivered uh, uh, in Cincinnati, it would be hard to count on the fingers of both hands and the toes of both feet, yea, even on the hairs of one's youthful head, the opinions that have in fact been rendered not on the basis of what the Constitution originally meant, but on the basis of what the judges currently thought it desirable for it to mean. Uh, and that's certainly true, and, and that is a problem. I, I, I agree with the points that have been made about the importance of making originalist argument, but I think it also must be acknowledged it is much easier to make originalist argument in areas like in District of Columbia versus Heller, where the question presented is one of first impression, and where you do not have this accumulated body of non-originalist, non-federalist precedent to contend with. In the area of federalism, we have decades and decades of opinions that, that do not apply the original meaning of the limited enumerated powers, and there is a question of what to do about that. And, I, and in thinking about what to do about that, I think it's worth looking at what the Rehnquist Court did uh, in the New Federalist, its New Federalist jurisprudence. And I think it's important to acknowledge, and I realize my time is running short, so I will say this very quickly. The Rehnquist Court did not seek to impose an originalist conception of the limits on federal power. And it is a fair critique of the Red, Red, Red Quest Court's jurisprudence in areas of sovereign immunity, uh, uh, commandeering, and the like, that these opinions are not purely originalist in that they are not simply the application of the original public meaning of the Constitution's text to those questions. But I think they are uh, uh, consistent with an originalist principle that when we consider questions about the scope of federal power, one thing we must do recognizing Chief Justice Marshall's admonition that federal action must be consistent not merely with the letter but also the spirit of the Constitution, one thing we must not do is endorse or allow a conception of federal power that obliterates the distinction between federal and state and that obliterates the underlying federalist structure. And so what the Rehnquist Court sought to do was to identify limits that could be adopted consistent with those decades of precedent that were true to the idea of limited power uh, without going uh, the, full, the, the full step of seeking to reimpose limits uh, anticipated by the text. And I think that's a way to understand cases like Lopez, like Morrison, and I think it's a way to understand, for example, the commerce and spending clause holdings uh, of uh, NFIB versus Sibelius, to say, in a sense, go forth and sin no more uh, to Congress. Uh, we're not going to un uh, uh, uproot all the things you've done up till now that are inconsistent with the original public meaning of the text. Uh, but we are not going to bless an interpretation of your power that obliterates all, all limits. And I think the question going forward is, the extent to which we should content ourselves with this kind of hold the line view of, of federalism, uh, or the extent to which we can seek to restore the true original public meaning of the underlying text. Thank you. We're We're going to leave a little bit of time for questions, but before we get to that, I'd like to invite each member of the panel to give any reactions to other panelists, just, just a minute or two each, if you, if you would. Sure. So uh, just a couple of points. The first on, on Heller, what I found interesting about Heller is um, it was a, uh, both the majority and the dissent were fighting entirely on originalist grounds. And so a criticism of, of Heller um, I, I think this is one tribute to Justice Scalia that you can measure his jurisprudence against his jurisprudential philosophy. And so it can be measured as, uh, uh, as against the original public meaning. Um, and I also find interesting that Justice Stevens uh, certainly wasn't an originalist. Um, uh, his entire dissent was dedicated to just a different view of the history rather than on a living constitutionalist view that we now have a different society than we did in 1790. It's, uh, and for that reason, uh, we should have a different uh, Second Amendment. Um, and then with respect to uh, the point about it's we the people, I think 
the original's perspective on that point is it's not we the judges. So um, uh, certainly for some categories of things written down in a text, uh, the, the founders took away from the people the ability uh, to enact in a certain way. But for the rest, it, it, le it left the evolution uh, either to the states or to the federal government through democracy. And so originalism is entirely consistent with uh, we the people principles. Peter. Um, so this is really interesting. Just uh, a couple of things. So one thing, uh, Judge Katsas, you, you mentioned um, the Eighth Amendment and its kind of role in uh, living constitutionalism. So uh, people may or may not recall uh, Justice Scalia's uh, Judiciary Committee hearing where he was asked his theory, his, his theory of constitutional interpretation. And he did his sort of best uh, Sam Irvin imitation where he said, oh, you know, kind of like, aw shucks, you know, this is embarrassing to say. I don't really have a theory of constitutional <laughs> interpretation. Um, he, I think he said, uh, this is more or less a quote, you probably wouldn't call me uh, a living, con you know, a living constitutional list. Um, but even I would have to say, uh, I'd have a hard time saying that flogging was constitutional, even though it clearly was would have been constitutional uh, if you go by the original public meeting, 1789. So um, I, I think this, you know, underscores, in, in a way, uh, Jonathan speaks almost with a certain tone of regret or resignation. Or, but reality that you know there is, there are there's a body of precedent and you know we have to you know stare decisis is going to kick in. Um, there are other things that judges in 2018 are going to be thinking about, particularly when they're not facing a, a question of first impression. Um, that's probably a good thing because it allows even an originalist like Justice Scalia perhaps to say, you know, in, in, uh, in sadness more than in anger, I, I have to defer a little bit to modernity. Um, I do think, with regard to federalism, that in some ways, I, I would like to say that purposivism, uh, or, you know, a non-originalist view of uh, the Constitution, may give more congenial support for a robust version of federalism today than hearkening back to originalism. Um, I, I say that not because I think of the states as being defenseless and a kind of, you know, against, you know, that they would be tiny as opposed to the federal government. I mean, you know, California is much, has a much bigger government than the government of the United States in 1800. But um, there are lots of forces in our society today pushing in the, in, in the direction of cultural political, economic centralization, and having the states as kind of, uh, as a way of institutionalizing a kind of pluralism in our public philosophy may be more important because of the material and political conditions of 2018, maybe even than they were in 1789. Um, uh, cont contra to um, uh, Assistant Attorney General uh, uh, Wheedler, but maybe more sympathetic uh, to uh, Slicer Murphy, um, I think it's a good thing that states are being recognized as having standing. Uh, I, you know, a number of, uh, I speak as somebody who, th who thinks that the deferred action programs of the Obama administration were, were lawful, but having said that, I didn't think there was anything wrong with giving Texas uh, standing in the, in the uh, district court in Texas. Um, to, to, to challenge that. I mean, it, it seems to me, uh, to, to quote um, the conservative constitutionalist Henry Monaghan uh, on standing, you know, I want people to lose, I just want them to lose on the merits. And um, if we're gonna talk about Marbury, just to mention the, the quotes that, uh, the parts of the opinion that Jonathan alluded to but was not quoting, uh, what's a kind of interesting feature of the opinion is that he refers to the case as one of those cases in which the great principles of human liberty are not involved, which is interesting because you know it would be hard to find anything more controversial at the time than state than the respective authorities of state and federal government over banking. He didn't think of this as a case about liberty, and he reminded us that uh, you know in a constitution intended to endure for ages to come, only the great outlines could be marked. Um, and again, to invoke Larry Solom, uh, we have to recognize that the Constitution may mean things that it didn't actually say. Jonathan, briefly. Yeah, we're super brief. Um, uh, 
You know, so uh, on the way down uh, this morning, I, got, I listened to a great panel from the Georgetown uh, uh, con Student Conference about um, the role of the Declaration in, in the Constitution. And, it's, and just in, in, in relation to Peter's remarks on uh, the administrative state, one is um, concerns about the administrative state aren't, weren't alien to the founders. If you look at the, the, the complaints in the Declaration of Independence, there are concerns about the independence of judges, which certainly uh, relates to how we uh, select and remove and control administrative law judges. There is also my favorite list of, uh, uh, of the king's offenses. He has erected a multitude of new offices and sent hither swarms of officers to harass our people and eat out their substance. All right, this could have been written by Phil Hamburger, right? Uh, uh, um, and, and so I, I, I think that, that uh, it's not that the Constitution's inapplicable to the administrative state. It's just that it may constrain our ability to create certain sorts of administrative structures. And if so, our choice is to either find different structures to achieve those ends, and I think there's lots of room there, or uh, to use the proper process to amend it. Let's take some questions uh, from the mic, please. Hi, well, this is really short. Lee Strang from Toledo. This, my question is for General Murphy, and I make basically the same argument that you make to my students, that originalist arguments should be part of your toolkit that you use as an advocate. What would you say in response to this criticism, though? So on the appellate court level, at the lower federal court level, they're bound by Supreme Court precedent, which covers most areas of most law. You cited a concurrence. It's, it's notable because it's exceptional, right? On the Supreme Court level, there is, as Jonathan pointed out, non-originalist precedent that covers most areas of law. And the Supreme Court justices who are aligned or were aligned with originalism, uh, Justice Scalia tended to follow precedent, maybe nibbling around the edges. Justice Thomas is the only justice who at least so far has indicated significant willingness to move against existing precedent. The hellers of the world are rare, as we already talked about, that there aren't many cases without much precedent. And I think the Crawfords of the world are also rare because it requires an alignment of the original meaning and the non-originalist justices' uh, progressive policy preferences. And so what would you say in response to that, to that challenge to your position? So I guess, I guess two points. The first is, of course, um, if there's a precedent directly on point, uh, I think you, you, um, the, the, most, the most you can do in the lower courts is uh, uh, what was done in Janus, uh, we'll talk about earlier, is uh, preserve, the, preserve the issue and then have the Supreme Court take a, take a second look. But I do think that there are a lot of um, areas of vagueness and precedent where originalism principles can come into play. Uh, the Ohio v. Clark, I think, I mean, that's one example that immediately came to mind because they're just, uh, the confrontation clause, they, they adopted this testimonial test, and then in applying the test to new circumstances, you can look to historic materials uh, to determine the appropriate answer. I think you can do that in a lot of areas. I think uh, a lot of precedents, uh, a lot of the court's current jurisprudence is precedents with balancing tests. And when there are balancing tests, one of the factors to be considered could always be the originalist with, with originalist um, understanding with respect to whatever the question is before the court. <clears throat> David. Thank you. Uh, David Forte, my first request is would the panelists please bring those microphones much closer? It's been very difficult hearing, and I'm only halfway back. Um, uh, my question is to all three panelists. Could, could you please give us, with some specificity, uh, what you believe the original understanding of the federal structure was? So, uh, I'll start. I mean, it, very briefly, right? A, a federal government of limited and enumerated powers that are uh, uh, with uh, a plenary police power that is that is for federal purposes reserved to the states. Obviously, states under their own constitutions may have their power constrained, but that would be a function of largely of state constitutions with the exception of those handful of areas that the Constitution removes from state authority. Yeah, I would, I would largely agree with that. I think that Article I lists the powers of, of Congress, and those are few and enumerated, and the states have the residual sovereignty and all the remaining powers. And I would say uh, I don't disagree with that at that level of generality, but I think that level of generality doesn't suffice to decide a lot of cases. Anybody else? All right, well, let, let me ask you a question. Um, 
Peter, you made the point that the Constitution is designed to set up a system of majority rule or, I didn't or say that. Democratic, democratic government, and there's something awkward in when you have a hard case where text or history doesn't seem to answer a question much one way or the other. There's something awkward using the Constitution to trump whatever modern folks are doing. Mm -hmm. Is that an argument for upholding things in hard, modern practices in hard cases, or is it an argument for looking to something other than historical practice or constitutional text? Well, I, so, I, and I think this goes back to a point that I, I, I thought, um, you know, Eric was making before about, you know, non-originalists finding, you know, also being interested in originalist arguments. So, it, it may, the, the, the reason why the, dis, the dichotomy is sometimes overdrawn is that there are very few purposes that progressives would, might attribute to the Constitution that can't find some basis in originalism stated at a somewhat higher level of generality. So if I were, um, so, so you have the Securities Exchange Commission, it, it's going after businesses. Um, the question is, uh, is are, are the values of the framers, put, put aside, you know, the officer employee thing. I, I'm not sure they had a comprehensive theory of it. If they did, they seem to violate it all the time. Um, I think that's, that, I, think, I think the um, SEC should win this case on originalist grounds. But that is even on the narrow historical facts. But even if not, I mean, there was a value placed on independent judgment. There's obviously a value being placed on due process. Noticing that this current system which doesn't allow the members of the SEC to determine who is going to be the judge in the case going after you, sounds like it's consistent with the original values. So uh, I guess the way I think of originalism and the relationship of originalism and non-originalism is just, you know, in those cases where there's room for interpretation, I'm willing to kind of step back and say, yes, the Constitution doesn't provide for an Air Force. I still want one. Can I just uh, sure. Go ahead. Come on. I mean, I think I think there are two questions that we that we want to separate. Right? One is, what is the proper way to interpret and understand the Constitution? There's a second question, which I think is is implicit here about the extent to which courts should defer to, or at least give some degree of respect to the judgments that are made by the other branches. Right. So so if Congress. Uh, through process of deliberation comes to a different conclusion about the proper interpretation of a given provision and the constraints that imposes, then the courts might, to what extent should the courts give regard to uh, 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 that congressional judgment? And I think that's a very serious question. Uh, and I think it's one that's been complicated by the fact that the modern practice, especially in Congress, and sometimes in the executive branch, although less so in the executive branch, is to not engage in that inquiry. Uh, uh, right? So if you read David Curry's fabulous histories um, uh, of, of the Constitution in Congress, the, uh, in the early years, the degree to which Congress took very seriously the idea that it had to convince itself that it was acting within the scope of its power. Um, I think if that's what Congress is doing, then there's a very strong argument that courts should recognize that, hey, this might not be the, the decision we might have reached, but uh, you know, uh, uh, political actors uh, w who themselves are delegated power by the people uh, in the exercise of their power made a good faith judgment that uh, this this was a proper exercise of their power. That, that there's a strong argument there. It's harder when you have members of Congress not reading statutes, uh, laughing or or disregarding questions about the source of constitutional authority for enactments as members of congressional leadership have done. Uh, when presidents say, uh, I think portions of a statute are unconstitutional, but I'm going to sign it anyway. Um, uh, you know, when agency heads say, uh, we didn't even look at the legal question before taking this action. Um, then I think the, the argument that courts should be deferential is weaker. And, and, and I'm not sure I have a purely administrable standard here, but I think as a practical matter, that, that presumption of, of regularity is based upon uh, a plausible argument that the other branches are fulfilling that obligation. 
We have time for one more question. All right, uh, thank you. Uh, Charles Miller, uh, Cincinnati. Uh, in addition to this, uh, this ALJ uh, case, what, uh, what cases are out there that are percolating or issues where you could see this uh, originalist arguments uh, perhaps being successful in the near future? Well, I suppose we will know um, some, you know, uh, again, General Murphy's going to be much more up on the criminal law cases than, than I would be. Um, administrative law is the territory um, Professor Adler and I usually inhabit. The, the case that I'm sort of watching at the moment is, um, you know, whether or not there's going to be a, a cert petition in the CFPB case. Uh, asking whether or not it's constitutional to have uh, an independent agency, an independent agency with a single head as opposed to a multi-member head. And one of the fascinating things about that case, so the DC Circuit panel, uh, in an opinion by Judge K uh, Kavanaugh, uh, Federalist Society stalwart, wrote a stunningly <laughs> non-originalist opinion uh, for the unconstitutionality of the CFPB. He, he sort of has a, 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 he kind of invents a um, uh, protection against arbitrary government standard uh, and then says, well, independent agencies you know, might be unconstitutional in general, but it's too late, you know, that water's passed under the bridge, so we can get more or less the same protection against arbitrary government by insisting on uh, a collegial head of independent agencies. And uh, the, the court and bank in the D.C. Circuit uh, reversed that. Um, the, the company whose uh, judgment was at stake actually won on the statutory ground. So I'm, I'm thinking that, you know, it was weird also that the, the panel didn't just stop with the statutory standard on which they were all agreed. Um, so I don't know if, uh, you know, cert's going to be pursued, but that would be yet another interesting case for originalist argument. Uh, I can list a couple. The, the political gerrymandering cases that are up there right now, there's a long tradition of political gerrymanders dating back to the, the name gerrymander. <laughs> um, uh, uh, and also, on the, the, the mention the criminal cases, there's lots of very interesting Fourth Amendment cases that ha have or will be argued. Um, there, there's a case involving whether somebody who uh, is driving a car, a rental car, but isn't on the agreement is entitled to Fourth Amendment protection. A uh, very interesting oral argument where, where Justice Gorsuch took a, a property rights approach to the Fourth, fourth Amendment, uh, at least during uh, questioning and an oral argument. A few other uh, cases percolating in the Fourth Amendment context, including a one about, uh, do you remember the name of the case about um, uh, a GPS trans, uh, tra transitioning and, uh, and um, uh, using uh, uh, searches of, uh, of your phone to find your location. I forget Carpenter? the name of the case. Oh, Carpenter. Carpenter. It's Carpenter versus United States. Uh, also very uh, interesting, uh, or chance for very interesting originalist arguments. <clears throat> yeah, I, I agree that the, the CFPB case presents an opportunity for the court to uh, resort to originalist principles, although I think there's a strong likelihood, and I would certainly have a different interpretation of Judge Kavanaugh's opinion, um, that the court would do something similar to what we saw the Rehnquist do in the federalism area. That is to say, there's a strong argument that independent agencies of this sort were unconstitutional, period. Humphrey's executor is not a particularly uh, originalist opinion. It's worth noting that um, Justice Scalia, in the lecture I quoted before, his essay on originalism, the lesser evil, delivered at Cincinnati, starts with the discussion of Justice Taft's decision in, in Myers, which in many respects was a, an originalist opinion uh, in a way that Humphrey's executor was not. I don't think any of us expect the court to overturn Humphrey's executor, uh, but it, it certainly seems possible that the court could, as I think Judge Kavanaugh, one way to characterize Judge Kavanaugh's opinion is to say, we know what the originalist outcome would be in this case. Uh, we are going to reach that outcome, and we are going to embody the principle that, that you know, we're not going to overturn our prior precedents, but we are going to identify a way to limit the scope of those precedents. Another case where we might see something similar the court has granted for next term is a case called Gundy. It involves the Sex Offender Registration Notification Act, and it presents an interesting non-delegation issue. Now, there's no chance the court is going to uh, overturn American trucking and so on and, and, and fully reinvigorate the non-delegation clause. 
but insofar as there are serious originalist arguments about the scope of delegation that we allow today, I could see the court saying this is a significant step beyond what we have blessed before. It would clearly be in tension with an original understanding of the nature of legislative power, and so we are going to identify a, a way to limit uh, the scope of what we uh, of existing precedent, so as to preserve the underlying principle that is consistent with an original understanding. Please join me in thanking the panel for their excellent presentation.